Welcome to today's program, part of the Cadigo Genetics and CKD webinar series. Today's enduring webcast is episode five, Controversies, Barriers, and Practical Challenges to Genetic Testing in CKD. Some background on today's program, a link to the CME details and a copy of the slide deck is provided in the video description below. This activity is jointly provided by Global Education Group and Cadigo, and this activity is supported by an educational grant from Natera. Here we are sharing an overview of the program, as well as our educational objectives for today. Today's faculty are Professor Jan Halbreder, Nephrogenetics Research Group, University Hospital Leipzig, Leipzig, Germany, and Professor Rosa Tora, Inherited Kidney Diseases Clinic, Barcelona, Spain. Here you will find the Physician Accreditation Statement, the Physician Credit Designation, the Global Contact Information, and the Term of the Offering. Also, please find the instructions to receive credit, the system requirements, and the fee information and refund cancellation policy. This is the disclosure of conflicts of interest. Here you'll find the disclosure of unlabeled use and our disclaimer for today's Enduring Webcast. Now I'll turn things over to Professor Jan Halberder. Go ahead, sir. Well, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be part of the Kidigo uh, webinar series. And my um, short intro is I'm uh, a um, adult nephrologist from the University of Leipzig in Germany with a special interest in hereditary kidney diseases, both clinically and um, scientifically. So nothing to disclose from my side. Um, I'll start with the first part of the presentation, which is about genetic testing in general, CKD and CKD of unknown etiology. So when we talk about genetic testing, we want to distinguish between um, mon Mendelian or monogenic kidney disease and uh, complex inheritance and complex diseases. So these two entities, they are basically characterized by either finding genetic findings that are rare, that are not frequently present in the general population. So rare variants that have a high penetrance, a high effect size, a high odds ratio. Um, and you can nicely illustrate that um, for UMOT, the uh, gene encoding uromodulin, the most abundant protein in human urine. And UMOT variants um, have been associated with ADTKD, autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease, um, rare pathogenic variants. But on the other hand, we know that common human variants are associated with CKD progression, but those common variants have a small effect size. So those uh, cumulative small effect sizes can then account for creatinine variability, for instance. And you see, on the um, x-axis, on, 
on, on the left side or the right side of the x-axis, there are some complex entities like membranous nephropathy, but also APOL1 associated kidney disease. And this APOL1 associated entities, they are kind of special because their common variants have a significant effect size as well. How can we deal with these common variants? Well, there is in clinical practice not not really routinely used, but it's starting um, that polygenic risk scores are being established. For instance, in membranous nephropathy, um, this NICE risk score has been um, published last year that shows that multiple variants here have a cumulative pathogenicity. And the more of these common variants um, a person accumulates, the higher the odds ratio is. On the other hand, we have monogenic CKD evaluation. And here, as I said, single variants harbor a significant pathogenic effect. And we know, um, at least from the landmark study by Emily Groupman and Ali Garavi um, from 2019, that about 10% of the adult CKD population harbors a monogenic or Mendelian kidney disease. And you see in this pie chart, the six most common genes that are affected, it's PKD1-2 that accounts for AD PKD, so polycystic kidney disease. And then the collagen-4 genes, A5 to A3, that are also pretty frequent. And then UMOT, the gene we already talked about associated with AD TKD. And you see in this gray part of the pie chart, there are at least 60 remaining genes with rare kidney diseases that um, can be found in, in such big cohorts. So speaking about genetic testing in clinical practice, we can distinguish three categories more or less. We have the diagnostic aspect because testing can be used for CKD differential diagnosis to detect an underlying genetic cause that wasn't known before. We can use genetics for prediction once genotype-phenotype correlations are established in a certain condition to then estimate cause of disease or disease severity. And ideally, we would like to use genotype-specific treatment. Um, unfortunately, this isn't available in a lot of CKD conditions yet, but ideally, genotype-specific treatment is the goal to then have a therapeutic implication depending on the individual genotype. So starting with diagnostics, um, the genetic approaches we usually use to uh, detect single polynucleotide um, variants are traditional Sanger sequencing. Once we really know that it's only one or two genes that um, have to be analyzed, something like uh, GLA in Fabry's disease, where it's clinically or by enzymatic testing, it's obvious that it's about Fabry disease that we want to be, want to analyze. Then second, we have targeted next generation sequencing panels, gene panels that can comprise 20 to 2000 genes. And we want to sequence a, a group of genes that are responsible for a certain phenotype. And then there is more holistic approaches like exome or genome sequencing, where all 20,000 genes of the human genome are analyzed. And what people usually do nowadays in diagnostics is to then run a virtual gene panel over the exome data set to analyze known CKD genes on a very broad basis. So the bottleneck of genetic testing nowadays is variant interpretation because with big data and next generation sequencing, we get a lot of variants that need to be interpreted. And in 2015, uh, the ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics introduced um, more objective criteria to classify variants into one of five classes, reaching from benign variants to definitely pathogenic variants. And um, these kind of tools can also be um, manually um, accessed. Um, as you see, you can um, online you can use those um, criteria, access uh, variant criteria, and then do your own assessment. The variant interpretation is challenging because um, there is many things that have to be taken into account. There is uh, frequency and population databases. As I said, we want rare variants to 
um, for a Mendelian disease. Then there is um, presence in patient databases, um, ideally databases that are specific for the disorder, like the PKD database or GLINVAR. Then there is in silico variant analysis where we have um, CAT score, for instance, or prediction tools that are summarized in CAT score that are based on evolutionary conservation of an amino acid residue or whether a amino acid change falls into a critical protein domain and so on. And then we have, sometimes we lag out and have actual in vitro variant analysis where a functional assay was even um, conducted to assess variant pathogenicity um, based on cell culture or um, advanced um, cell culture models. So out of these five classes, only likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants are then called diagnostic. Um, and a special concern is the many, many variants of unknown significance that we mostly cannot really um, use in clinical practice. The current aim is to refine ACMG criteria and to make them gene and disease specific. And in the community, there's already um, initiatives um, have been started for ADPKD for Alport syndrome to, to come up with refinements of, for specific CKD conditions that are common. So chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology is a topic on its own because uh, this actually means that um, we have, and that's quite frequent in adult nephrology, that we have um, patients where we really don't know what's the underlying primary renal disease. Unfortunately, there's no unified definition of CKD of unknown etiology to date. But one or the consensus kind of is that um, people either lack renal histology, so they have trophic kidneys and renal biopsy has never been performed. Um, some people also take into this group people with unspecific histology that is not really pointing into um, one of the definite causes. So FSGS can be due to primary reason, uh, primary causes to secondary causes, familial or secondary um, causes uh, related to obesity and so on. Entities like chronic interstitial nephritis are very broad um, and are not really specific. Um, and the same is true for TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy. So unknown etiology is also being used this term in entities like Mesoamerican nephropathy or Balkan nephropathy, where it's more CKD outbreaks in, in rural agricultural communities um, in different regions of the world. And in those, in those cases, it's um, rather thought to be an environmental factor that contributes based on a genetic background. How frequent is this phenomenon of unknown etiology? Well, it seems to be pretty frequent from registry data, here it's the ERA EDTA registry. Um, we know that about 20% or at least 20% of the ERSID population um, is classified as CKD of unknown etiology. And it's the same in the US renal data system. There have been a few studies that actually incorporated groups or patients with CKD of unknown etiology. Um, the diagnostic yield in those studies is very um, discrepant, but it really depends on how the study was designed, how the inclusion criteria were defined, whether it is a pre-selected cohort, whether uh, the whether children were involved or it's an, an adult study only. But as you can see, it's um, it's reaching from 12 to over 60 percent the diagnostic yield, and um, what is most common um, as genetic diagnosis is Alport syndrome. Because Alport syndrome is, um, is difficult to diagnose without renal biopsy, uh, especially in cases that don't have extra renal manifestation uh, like deafness and so on. And Alport syndrome due to collagen 4 variants seems to be very underdiagnosed. And um, we, we see that in patients with CKD of unknown etiology as the most common condition. So 
genetic testing um, in CKD patients, um, stage five, it is still useful um, for patients on the wait list because it is um, valuable to estimate a risk of recurrence. We might use it to personalize immunosuppression like in TMA conditions where ecolizumab might be used to prevent recurrence after transplantation. And it is useful to select uh, related living kidney donors to really assure that a donor won't run into um, the risk of um, being um, on dialysis after so many years. Beyond the kidney transplant wait list in stages one to four, genetic testing can ensure timely initiation of specific treatment options as we have available in Alport syndrome with ACE inhibitors, in ADPKD with uh, tolvaptan, for instance, or in Fabry's disease and other conditions where enzyme replacement therapy is indicated. And on the other hand, it may help to avoid uh, immunosuppressive treatment in conditions like genetic FSGS or Alport syndrome. How can we increase the pretest probability um, in patients that we want to analyze? How can we ensure that we actually find um, genetic diagnoses? Well, positive family history is, of course, useful. Extra renal manifestation helps. But in certain conditions, we also have established clinical scores designed to increase pretest probability. And I want to introduce you to um, two of these scores um, that were set up for ADTKD UMOT and ADTKD HNF1 beta. For UMOT uh, last year, um, this score was published. Um, you see positive family history was taken into account um, age at young ons uh, at onset before 30 years of age, uh, serum uric acid levels um, and others. And a cutoff of five and higher is then predictive for um, ADTKD UMOT. And if you add urinary uromodulin levels, which is expected to be lower in affected patients, then you have a sensitivity of 94% with a decent specificity, which makes this score um, useful in clinical practice, I think. The HNF1 beta score was published a couple of years ago, similarly designed. Um, family history is uh, a point, kidney disease, pancreas involvement, as you know, um, monogenic diabetes is, can be associated, um, electrolyte disorders and others. And here the cutoff greater than eight gives you a sensitivity of 98% and a really high negative predictive value. So moving on to um, prediction, genetic testing can be useful for prediction of disease severity. And in a condition where this has been nicely established is ADPKD. Because ADPKD, we know that PKD1 and 2 disease behaves pretty differently. Renal survival is much better in carriers of PKD2 variants. And among carriers of PKD1 variants, we know that truncating variants are associated with um, a decreased renal survival. And then on the other hand, from novel ADPKD genes like ALG9 or DNAJB11 and GANAP, we know that these are mostly associated with mild cystic disease and a good renal prognosis. And therefore, genetic testing here is also useful to, for risk prediction and for estimation of the renal prognosis. So this has been nicely uh, incorporated in the pro-PKD score which takes into account clinical variables, gender, hypertension, urolo urological complications, but also the genetic testing then comes up with uh, points from zero to nine, um, which is predicting the cumulative probability of renal survival. And this can be nicely used then to, um, to come up with an indication of specific therapy in addition to the imaging classification. So treatment here, we don't have so many examples in chronic kidney disease, unfortunately. Um, we have one entity, and that's Fabry's disease, where we have a newer drug, Megalostat, a pharmacological chaperone that stabilizes misfolded 
alpha galactosidase A. And the um, developers have introduced a in vitro assay for testing of patient variants to predict whether a specific patient variant is really amenable to treatment with megalostat. And so uh, this drug was even licensed um, with a list of amenable and non-amenable variants. And this is a nice example how genotype-specific treatment could work. So I want to move on to uh, the role of modifiers. APOL1 is not really a modifier, rather a risk allele. And um, implications in transplantation, especially in, in living kidney donation. Genetic modifiers are defined um, as genes that affect phenotype or molecular expression of other genes. And genetic modifiers can affect penetrance, dominance, expressivity, and pleiotropy. So with NGS and um, broad genetic testing, we increasingly detect genetic findings that are indential, incidental, that are beyond the originally expected genotype. And I want to show you a, in, an example um, where we analyzed an ADPKD family with very discrepant age at ESRD. So while the mother had classic ADPKD with ESRD at age 54, her daughter was ESRD already at 10 years of age. And when we did, when we did mutation analysis, we detected in addition to the PKD1 pathogenic variant, we detected a WT1 splice site variant in the daughter. And this most likely explains the aggravated cause of disease in the daughter. And this example is illustrating a bit what we increasingly find um, one could say this is two distinct Mendelian diseases because WT1 is associated with Fraser syndrome and um, Dennis Thresh syndrome and so on. But we were interested in functional analysis and we could show that in mouse embryonic kidneys, PC1 expression actually was decreased upon knockdown of WT1. So we think that there might even be direct impact um, or a mutual um, impact of both variants. Another uh, phenomenon um, is collagen 4A3 to 5 variants that are probably most common. And we think that those can also function as modifiers, hypomorphic variants that modify the phenotype in different CKD entities. There are reports on collagen 4 variants in bilateral renal cystic diseases in thrombotic micro, microangiopathies. And these variants might not actually cause the primary renal disease, but may modify the phenotype or aggravate the phenotype in a way. Complement gene variants in, in general, responsible for um, atypical HUS or TMA, they don't function in a Mendelian way as a fully penetrant variant. They are risk variants that really need an additional trigger to then kick off complement overactivation. So I wanted to mention them in this in this category as well. Lastly, APOL1, you all know, is a probably the most famous risk allele in, in, in CKD. Um, very relevant um, to people from African-American or African origin. Discovered um, more than 10 years ago now, and APOL1 high risk variants are associated with FSGS, with HIV associated nephropathy, and non diabetic kidney disease. And you see here from left to right um, the odds ratios that, that fade out. But they have, in certain populations, those high risk variants of APOL1 have a very large effect size, and that's pretty pretty uncommon for, for a risk allele, and therefore APOL1 is really an, an example on its own. So what is the role of APOL1 in kidney transplantation? Briefly, for the recipients of um, APOL1 high-risk positive organs, um, it's, it's bad news because those allografts have a shorter survival. Um, APOL1 high-risk variants are associated with 
shorter allograft survival than low risk variants and Caucasian donors in general because they are not susceptible to APOL harboring APOL1 variants at all. And it's also associated with um, uh, de novo post transplantation FSGS, collapsing FSGS. For the donors, it's also not a good idea to donate a kidney um, if you are a carrier of high risk APOL1 variants because then you run into the risk of losing significantly GFR over uh, the decades after transplantation, after donation. Um, as you can see here, um, high-risk APOL1 genotype puts donors as, at risk to become um, severely, uh, to, be, to get into um, uh, advanced stages of CKD and eventually run the risk of um, rendering uh, ESR, into ESRD. So in summary, APOL1 uh, in kidney transplantation, the, the risk of allograft dysfunction is really traveling with the donor APOL1 genotype and not so much with the recipient genotype. And this suggests that kidney expressed rather than circulating risk variant APOL1 promotes kidney injury. So thank you very much for listening and for your attention. I'm happy to take questions and I'll now hand over to my colleague Rosa Torra who will um, present the next part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Jan, for this excellent talk. And thanks to KDIGO for organizing this uh, series of webinars, which I think are extremely interesting. And of course, thank you for inviting me. My name is uh, Rosia Tora. I'm an adult nephrologist uh, in Barcelona, and my field of interest are genetic kidney diseases. I will mainly talk about challenges to genetic testing. And these are my disclosures. We've heard enough along this series to know that a lot has changed since Mendel in the 19th century figured out that some traits were inherited to the 21st century where we have uh, NGS that uh, facilitates a lot in the sequencing of our genome. And of course, this uh, has been also the brief story of my professional life, starting with polyacrylamide genes in the 90s, then moving to Sanger sequencing and lately to NGS. NGS is an excellent tool that can potentially allow to sequence everybody's genome. And this uh, smooth the path to precision medicine, moving from the current discrete clinical data that we mostly use nowadays to the emerging high throughput data, including all the omics. And uh, we will focus, of course, in the genomics, gene panels, exons, and genomes, as uh, the writer already told us, explained us. And uh, because uh, the access to genetic information is um, uh, something very important, and there are some, some rules and some articles and some laws trying to protect it. For example, the Council of Europe in 1997 um, ruled that, uh, that uh, article saying that genetic testing should be only performed for health purposes or for scientific research linked to health purposes and always subject to appropriate genetic counseling. And what is exactly genetic counseling? Uh, every, cancer, every patient with an inherited condition has the right to receive genetic counseling, which is education and guidance offered by a professional advisor in order to help people make informed decisions about their health, their children's health, or their pregnancies based on genetic knowledge. So what exactly the genetic counselor is expected to do? Uh, he should promote informed decisions by involved family members, he should explain the pattern of inheritance of that particular disease. Uh, he should also provide explanations about the disease, its diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis. Um, he should very well explain alternatives regarding passing the disease to new generations. 
as you may imagine, all this information is difficult uh, for health professionals. Uh, can you imagine for patients? Then uh, some tips could be like using, being very careful with language. Um, not in order not to make it still more complicated than it is. We can't uh, name anything can be explained in an understandable way with daily life names. For, for example, proptosis. It's a very weird word for most of the people. Instead of proptosis, we can use bulging eyes, eyes bulging out, prominent eyes. So there's always an easy word, an easy series of words to explain a condition. The genetic counselor will do a pre-test and a post-test information. The pre-test will consist mostly on the informed consent for genetic testing. Uh, it's, this uh, informed consent must contain the aim of the test and its consequences, the place where the test will be performed, the destiny of DNA samples after testing, who will have access to results, if unblinded or unblinded, the possibility of unintended secondary findings and the acceptance or non-acceptance um, by the individual to know these findings, the implications for relatives and the commitment to provide genetic counseling. There are some ethical, legal and social issues re uh, relating to the return of genetic results, that is the post testing, counseling. There is no standardized methods for returning genetic results today, and there are many stakeholders, such as patients, their families, geneticists, physicians, uh, researchers. And um, as I mentioned before, informed consent should be very clear whether the patient or the individual opts to refuse any research level or clinical genetic test findings besides the specific purpose of that test. So results related to the study purpose or unintended secondary findings. These unintended secondary findings are very or quite common when we perform um, exome sequencing or genome sequencing. Uh, it's not the case when we do panel sequencing because in there we have the specific genes for a certain condition or group of, uh, of diseases. But for exome and genome sequencing, we may find uh, DNA, pathogenic DNA variants in important genes that are not the scope of our study. Then what to do? Uh, medically important and actionable results should be reported to patients uh, if they, they, uh, they allow us, of course. Um, there are some recommendations uh, to return secondary findings by the American College of Medical genetics and genomics. Um, they recommend to return information of some genes. Uh, in this table, you can see some of them. These genes encompass conditions deemed to be highly penetrant and actionable and preliminarily consist of those that are associated with various hereditary forms of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Although beneficial, uh, has all, uh, it's also brought some debate around issues of informed consent, patient autonomy, and the return of results for at all onset conditions to pediatric patients. And uh, regarding uh, the kidney genes involved or present in that table, we have four hippolindaus, tuberous sclerosis, and Wilms tumor. All of them are a type of tumor genes that um, by means of um, close surveillance, we can detect very early the, the appearance of a tumor and act accordingly. Uh, once you have your gene uh, testing results, you have uh, the diagnosis of a condition that may change uh, your life or your future. Um, but what has been regulated by in this case, but uh, the USA government um, is that these results, even being very helpful for you, uh, shouldn't uh, be misused uh, in terms of discrimination for health insurance and employment. And this is addressed by the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 in the US. 
I think it's a very important step uh, forward to avoid any discrimination based on genetic findings. There are also some regulations regarding genetic testing, how we do it and who should do it. Um, Genetic testing in most countries in Europe uh, require uh, specific medical supervision, um, but the qualifications of that medical professional change depending on the country. But also always a genetic test for health purposes should be performed by medical supervision. Now, what about genetic tests online? This is something new, but you can find it in the most well-known platforms. Uh, these tests are advertised, sold, and delivered in a very easy and quite cheap way without any involvement of medical professional. So what are the pros of this genetic testing, if any? Well, it may enhance the autonomy of consumers. It allows patients to be in charge of their health care without the intermediary of doctors and avoiding waiting lists. Um, it's being said that consumers have a right to have their genetic information and by circumventing the public healthcare system, the privacy of genetic data may or may not be better protected. And what are the cons, uh, which I think overweight the pros of gen, gene tests uh, online? There's an absence, an absolute absence of medical supervision, and therefore genetic counseling too. There, it may cause unnecessary distress to, to individuals. Um, it, the information accompanying this test is not always uh, reliable. It may be misleading or inadequate, and this is the cause of this uh, distress to, to, the, to, to the customers. Um, some of them have unproven or unclear validity, uh, in, in, they are useless, and um, some concern has been raised about the potential inappropriate testing of minors. Uh, if, he, if you have a genetic counselor, he will always uh, explain a lot this, uh, this issue, but in an online test, nobody will ask you. And finally, the downstream costs for the healthcare system are not um, are, may, may be significant because um, I, I, I faced that a few times. Uh, someone orders a test and gets a result that it's not clear, but mentions a gene or a couple of genes, and then that individual thinks that he may be affected by that disease and then ask for an appointment and then you spend lots of time explaining him that this has uh, no relevance. So yeah, it's a big burden. There are still unresolved issues regarding genetic testing. The social implications, we, we mentioned that on insurance and employment. The costs and reimbursement of genetic testing, it is still an expensive test in most of the countries. Uh, so there is not universal access, but not also because of cost and reimbursement, but also because many healthcare providers are not used to order these tests and they have not been educated on, in, in, this, um, in this aspect. So um, there, there's a need to raise awareness. Um, pediatric screening, I've uh, told you that, uh, pediatric screening of late onset diseases, that is an unresolved issue. The unequal access to genetic counseling. For some centers, um, they can order a genetic test, they send it somewhere, but they do not have nobody in, in, in that uh, healthcare center to provide genetic counseling. Uh, privacy laws, there is a kind of conflict between patient privacy and confidentiality versus the wishes of those who want to share their medical data for the betterment of society. Finally, the role of patient views and patient-centered outcomes or experiences is extremely relevant, and we must pay attention to that and incorporate uh, this to daily practice. For example, I like very much this, uh, this sentence that I read in an article in Clinical Jason last year, uh, if I did, it, it's from a patient, it says, if I did not know about genetic testing, I would have had children and perhaps unknowingly passed on the gene that could diminish their quality of life. Genetic testing is so important because it is not just my child's life that is involved, but also anyone involved in caring for a child with diagnosed skin disease. So definitely their opinions, their beliefs, their reactions, 
uh, their feelings are extremely interesting in this situation you know, in, in genetic counseling, genetic testing. For example, when, when offering them the reproductive options, this is something we must be very careful and listen and watch their uh, reactions. These are mainly the four options that uh, we can offer patients. So one of them, of course, is doing nothing and accept the X percent of passing over the disease, like 25 or 50 percent, depending on the pattern of inheritance. Then we have insemination or ovodonation, prenatal testing and pre-implantational testing. I will quickly go through these options. Artificial insemination, uh, it consists of the deposit of a ster sperm and naturally in the female reproductive system in order to achieve a gestation. It is a low complex technique that can be done in the consultation of the gynecologist. And of course, uh, keep in mind that it, uh, it, it, it produces genetically unrelated children, unrelated to the father. The essential requirements uh, for the male is to well rule out any infectious or genetic diseases, as well as assess some phenotypic and psychological features. And for females, just to have permeable fallopian tubes. Prenatal diagnosis is another option that can only be offered after genetic testing and obtaining a certain uh, DNA, pathogenic DNA variant. So it consists on a chorionic villus biopsy in weeks 9 to 12 of pregnancy, after a normal pregnancy, and then analyze whether the fetus has the disease or not. And if it has the disease, then it, it's followed by termination of pregnancy. And if not, the pregnancy continues. The pre-implantation genetic testing consists of an in vitro fertilization with an uh, interesting plasmatic sperm injection, followed by a biopsy of the embryo, which has like eight cells. And then we analyze whether that single cell has the pathogenic DNA variant present in the father or mother. And finally, we implantate the disease-free embryos. This is, of course, an IVF process with all the hormone therapy, the extraction of eggs, in vitro fertilization, and finally, the embryonic transfer. The process is not easy. It is expensive and it's complex. Um, this could be a good situation to obtain like 10 to 15 eggs, but the number of uh, fertilized eggs can be like half of them. And maybe not all of them will have a correct evolution. Maybe four of them will have. And then just half of them will have disease-free um, embryos. So finally, the number of implanted embryos is one or two. And the pregnancy rate is around 30 to 40%. So when offering these techniques, be aware of the success of the techniques. There are also some uh, ethical issues around PGT. For example, in Spain, um, it's allowed for severe early onset and non susceptible to treatment diseases. But what is severe or what is early onset? For example, because uh, polycystic kidney disease is, is allowed, then if you compare that to this uh, extremely severe early onset neurological disease for kids, that seems very different, okay? But it's still approved. And but not only this, but also you must pay attention and consider and be um, extremely respectful to the patient's uh, religion, beliefs, or thoughts. Um, this is something extremely important. The genetic counselor will never advise, and never support one of the decisions. Just uh, give lots of information and satisfy all the desire for information that the, the couple has, but never support any option. And this can be a very stressful situation. And uh, when there's anxiety, when the, the information has caused a traumatic situation, or when you detect emotional fragility, a low level of understanding, please seek psychological support for your patients because they will need it. Also, patient advocacy groups are of great help. They share experiences and thoughts, and they usually feel quite comfortable among other patients with the same disease. 
And I would like to end with a couple of cases. Uh, this is a 34 years old male with ADPKD and a GFR of 45. This is a sporadic case with a truncating mutation in PKD1. And that man wanted to have disease-free offspring. The couple opted for IVF with PGT and with a single cycle of PGT, of IVF PGT, they obtained a lot of embryos that allowed them uh, for three pregnancies so far. And the first one, they had uh, twins, and then the second one, a girl, and then the third one, a girl. So uh, four kids in just one cycle of IVF and PGT. So this is an extremely uh, nice outcome. This 32 years old male, recently diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis. He also wanted uh, embryo selection, but it was a sporadic case and we couldn't identify any mutation. That happens in like 15, 20% of patients with TSC and then maybe because they have mosaicism and although NGS helps a lot with mosaicism, there are still some cases that escape the detection threshold. So that patient couldn't be offered prenatal or pre-implantation genetic testing because we didn't know the, the pathogenic DNA variant, but he still wanted to have disease-free offspring, especially because you know that tuberous sclerosis, um, the parents or the father or the mother may have very mild disease, but he may have an extremely affected kid with uh, mental retardation and so on, early onset epilepsy. So um, I offered him artificial insemination from donor. He wasn't very happy with the idea at the beginning because he said, you know, when I was 25, I didn't know I had TSC. So how can you uh, promise me that the donor won't have any uh, genetic condition? Um, yes, I said, well, 100%, we cannot assure that, but at least some genetic tests are being done for the most frequent um, disorders. So well, they accepted uh, the risks and they had a healthy boy. So another successful outcome of, uh, of, uh, of reproductive options. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to my uh, people in my place. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yes, we do have some questions, so we'll dig right in here. What is the most common genetic cause of CKD of unknown etiology in adults that you encounter in your practice? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. Um, so I, I think the, 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 my own experience and, and what we see from the, from the literature is that in in these, especially in adult patients, the most common cause is really um, what we call Alport syndrome. Although we have to say um, it's not always full blown Alport syndrome. It's 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 collagen four A three to A five variants um, with either with uh, renal disease only in terms of FSGS or or um, renal disease uh, plus extra renal manifestation. In terms of deafness and and um, eye eye manifestation, but I think the reason for that is that that really um, oftentimes in uh, in these patients maybe a biopsy wasn't performed or a biopsy was performed but ele electron microscopy wasn't done and sometimes the diagnosis of Alport syndrome wasn't really um, fully available on a histological basis um, and sometimes we see that these kind of patients um, were just classified as hypertensive nephropathy um, based on light microscopy, but um, the, the histological diagnosis of Alport syndrome was just missed. Um, and then since genetics is very complex in collagen for nephropathies, um, we encounter, um, I mean, increasingly encounter uh, patients that are um, older females with collagen 4A5 variants um, that are yeah, not classic Alport syndrome, but have an increased risk of, uh, um, of CKD later in life. 
Um, and all that ends up um, in, in Alport syndrome and collagen 4 nephropathies being the most common entity in this regard. Rosa, do you want to add something? No, I totally agree. I mean, yes, Alport syndrome is, um, especially autosomal dominant form, is very tough to diagnose. I, the only way probably is genetic testing. And, and because the, the expression in a single family may vary so much, sometimes it's very difficult to figure out that it is really a genetic condition running on in the family. So uh, yeah, I think I would have to bear in mind always that uh, an adult patient with microhematuria and a um, certain degree of proteinuria with an unspecific kidney biopsy like FSGS or bit of mesangial expansion or something like this, um, that could be Alpro syndrome. And the only way is genetic testing because, uh, well, electron microscopy may help, of course, but uh, probably you always need uh, genetic testing for these late onset cases. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, another question. Is it always possible to offer PGT to patients with inherited kidney diseases? Well, I take that one. Um, well, as I showed you in the last case, it's not always possible to offer PGT because uh, we always need to have the, the pathogenic DNA variant because that will be what we will look in that single cell from, from the embryo. In certain cases, we can do linkage analysis and do that for so autosomal mainly dominant diseases, but um, we very much prefer to have the, the DNA, the pathogenic DNA variant. And also in some other cases, it may not be um, advisable to have a PGT because of the treatment, the hormone treatment needed, for example, for patients with polycystic kidney disease and huge livers, huge polycystic livers, that, uh, that uh, treatment with hormones, it's not, um, it's not uh, recommended. Yeah, I think this will be the main, the main barriers. Okay, great, thank you. Next. Is it acceptable to use the surplus DNA from genetic testing for research purposes? I would like to like that one, that one also. Uh, I mean, it is acceptable, but just provided that the patient has given ex explicit permission. I mean, in the informed consent for genetic testing, either for clinical purposes or for research, it should be very clear whether the patient approves and the using of the surplus of his DNA for research purposes. So it is acceptable, but always with, with um, an informed consent, consent. Do you agree, Jan? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's very important to, to address um, this question to to patients when when doing the when consenting, and in my experience, most of them are um, are willing to to opt in and and to advance uh, research in that field. Yeah. Okay, great. Last question is: uh, What are the key differences between monogenetic and polygenetic disorders leading to CKD? Well, I hope I, I, I covered that. It's, I think it's um, so ideally textbook wise, uh, the monogenic disorder is a single gene disorder, right? As, as included in the name. So it's a single variant that is, um, that is so pathogenic that it really um, has a, a, a distinct disease. Um, it's associated with a dis distinct disease in a, in a causative way. Um, but this is, of course, very, a, a theoretical concept. And what I want to emphasize that there is a continuum between monogenic and polygenic, and it's it's more a a category, a didactic category, maybe. And we see that every every monogenic disease is on an individual genetic background, and that's why 
monogenic diseases are very variable, uh, even within families with the same primary uh, gene variant. So I think the concept is nice to um, also to illustrate these uh, these two extremes, monogenic and complex inheritance. But we have to be aware that it's really um, it's really a continuum between single gene disorders and, and, and complex genetic disorders. Yeah, totally agree. On behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank Professor Jan Halberter and Professor Rosa Tora for their presentations today, as well as their deft handling of questions. Thank you both. Um, thank you. It was a pleasure to take part in this um, experience. Yeah, thank you very much. It has been really nice. Thanks for your active participation.